Assalamu alaikum. Dear, Dear Imam Omar, I, I hope this finds you well. The world is a beautiful place with much to appreciate, but it's also a place of stressful life events and daily hassles. People choose to deal with those hassles in different ways, some that are often misguided. Adopting the right attitude can go a long way in helping you not only conquer that stress, but to convert it into something positive. It's what I tried to convey to Sean when I found him smoking his daily blunt. I tried to tell him that I'd seen others get addicted to the stuff and ruin their lives. But he seemed pretty stubborn about it and insisted that it was just his daily moment of escape and that it wasn't affecting his approach to life at all. When I asked him if he feared getting addicted like others, he just walked off and said, I'm not like others. If you would have asked me before that happened, if I would ever consider it, I would have called you crazy. But suddenly my mind went to all sorts of places, convincing me that one time wouldn't hurt and that no one would find out anyway. On the way home, I thought about how silly it was for me to pick it up on a wild impulse. But I felt trapped into it already since I'd already started the process and the thoughts of escape and excitement started to race through my head uncontrollably. And just like that, the thoughts of thrill and excitement were replaced by the possibility of getting caught and losing my career and my life. I felt like such a fool and almost had a nervous breakdown. But for some reason, Allah veiled the eyes of that cop that day and guarded my honor even though I had no regard for his. I couldn't even look Fatima in the eyes that day. The last thing in the world I'd want to do is expose her to my own failings and wreck her future before she even really had a chance. But there she was in her beautiful innocence, tampering with the poison that I shamelessly brought home showing me that the consequences of my behavior would be lived not just by me, but by those who I claim to love most. So I went where no one could possibly see me, the dirtiest place in the home reserved only for filth. Yet Allah stopped me once again. This time, it was my annoying neighbor, John, who I thought was coming by to give me back my toolbox, but he actually did me a bigger favor. It's amazing how absent-minded I'd become and how horrible of a job I was doing covering my tracks. It was as if Allah was slowing me down and showing me how quickly things were going to unravel if I went through with this. That just because I'd entertained this thought didn't mean I had to accept it as my reality. That He was watching me the whole time and planning in my favor even as I tried to disobey Him. Who am I becoming? What am I doing? Who am I hurting? What am I running away from? What is my future? When will I wake up? I remembered the companion who was an alcoholic and seemed just like another drunk, but the Prophet peace be upon him believed in him and said that he loved Allah and his messenger and that that love would eventually bring him to his senses. I thought about what you said. And you're right. You're right. I'm not like others. You know, here you can see that Ziyara almost fell for that trick of shaitan, where he comes to you 
with this sin and he offers what appears to be a permanent solution but in reality it's just a temporary joy that's going to lead to a lifetime of problems and that's the thing here that's what life is all about forsaking these present desires these things that appear to be attractive recognizing that they might destroy our lives and our hereafter and you know when it comes to drugs in particular how many times have you seen people's lives actually get better after they started using drugs it starts off with one drug then it gets to the next drug because that drug's not satisfying anymore and you end up losing everything in this life and the next and you know at the at the end of the day if you notice he felt ashamed of himself when he realized that he was more worried about whether people would see him while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was watching him the whole time and a great Imam, Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, said that if a thief is robbing a house and he hears the door rattle and he goes and he hides, at that moment he went from committing a major sin to committing an act of disbelief because Allah was watching him the whole time and he wasn't afraid. And why is it that at times we reduce Allah to the lowest of our observers? It's like Allah is not even there. It's like you're saying, it's just Allah watching me right now, so it's not that bad. And Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, he heard a poet say, إِذَا مَا قَالَ لِي رَبِّي أَمَا اسْتَحْيَيْتَ تَعْصِينِي وَتُخْفِذْ ذَنْبَ عَنْ خَلْقِي وَبِالْعِسْيَانِ تَأْتِينِي That I'm afraid that Allah will say to me, weren't you ashamed of disobeying me, hiding that sin from the sight of people, but coming to me boasting with your disobedience? And so we have to hold ourselves to a certain standard where we feel that same shame in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether we're alone, or in front of people, and when the sight of the Creator becomes far more valuable to us than the sight of the creation. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you guys for watching this episode. We thank you all for your support. And we hope that you enjoyed watching it. Share it inshallah ta'ala, let people know. Make sure you like this video and you share it with your friends. If you haven't watched the previous episodes, make sure you click here. And if you'd like to watch the entire series, then click here for the playlist. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.